Imagine a world encompassed by the ocean, but glittering with the vastness of space. A realm where ancient ruins can be found on the smallest of islands, while monstrous leviathans dwell beyond what maps have charted. Welcome to today's video, where I will be answering the many questions asked about my comic, Starfish Lovers. It has been a long time coming, and I'm hoping that the information here will help state the need to know more about the world. I'm sure there will be more videos like this one in the future, but for now, let's dive into the world of Starfish Lovers. Starfish Lovers is a webcomic that started several years ago at the start of the pandemic. It is set in a collection of reefs known as Palu, which exists in what is known as the sea space. The sea space is a combination of ocean and outer space combined. I view it as a completely separate universe of our own, even though parts of it can be seen as a parallel to how our world works today. Palu consists of seven continents, with thousands of smaller islands and land masses between them. Their formations are very different from planets, but they do act very much like them. I view each of these continents and islands as flat land masses with living, breathing ecosystems. Obviously, certain areas will be more diverse than the others, but for the most part, they are almost all like their own separate little planets, but flat. Part of my assumption of how they could have been formed is that these were more like a collection of asteroids or chunks of other planets that were destroyed during planetary collisions. Over time, these flat rock formations drifted together and have done so for millennia. Perhaps certain land masses have a decent gravitational pull to keep all of these continents together rather than drifting apart into the ether. Each of these continents teems with vibrant ecosystems and intricate civilizations. The original species that dominated the reefs of Palu were the Grimalkin. They are a stockier and wilder cousin to the Mao, based off of big cats as opposed to the Mao who are based off of domestic cats. The Grimalkin possess an innate ability to use their bioluminescent coat patterns to communicate, bearing an intricate language that few outside of their race are able to understand. The language can be best compared to Morse code. However, the way that their patterns illuminate is similar to a shimmering pulse. Each color has significance, primarily in detailing the emotion or meaning behind the code that is pulsed from their pattern. Some colors are used universally or can have different meanings depending on the body language and words that are used during conversation. I view this communicative ability to be similar to fireflies, but a lot more complicated. Additionally, the Grimalkin are heavily connected to the lands they dwell in, and every detail of their culture emphasizes their unique bond. For instance, the Grimalkin that existed in Emmerich, known as the Amar, were closely bonded with various creatures on the reef. The iconography of the Lopa, a splice between wolf and an otter, is an example, often used as an intimidating motif to warn off threats. The Lopa exist in almost every aspect of the life of the Amar, and were ridden as mounts as well as kept as guardians of sacred spaces. Since the Amar integrated with the Mal, and were the few clans that were not conquered, this appreciation for the Lopa was added to the culture of Emmerich. The Lopa are often added as motifs of protection, given to sacred spaces like churches. They are often made to be gargoyles or large statues placed in front of estates. Sometimes even Lopas themselves are added to the home or buildings as guard animals. Even though the Grimalkin are often viewed as tribal by the Mao, they were relatively advanced, and built a vast empire spanning across each of the different reefs. There are many remnants of their civilizations and architectural achievements that span across the reefs today. These Grimalkin ruins stand as a solemn reminder of the impact the Mao had on the Grimalkin upon their arrival to the reefs. The Mao are considered an extraterrestrial species that are not native to the reefs of Palu. They essentially invaded and conquered the reefs from the Grimalkin. The Fold, the primary religious organization of Emmerich, spins a tale about how they were the victims of a misunderstanding that led them to taking over the neighboring territories from the Grimalkin. This act eventually led to the integration or subjugation of many Grimalkin clans dotting across the reef, at least in this case for Emmerich, which is the main setting for starfish lovers. Emmerich is steeped in religious tradition and drowned and deception and political intrigue. Much of its history is heavily controlled by the Fold, and it will leave you questioning what is up or down. This is the predicament Pinky, also known as Pavo Donolo, faces through the rest of the story. The role of Pinky as the main lead in Starfish Lovers is to be a transformative chess piece that represents my interpretation of deconstructing faith. 
He doesn't have a direct line with the political plot that is brewing in the background of the story, but he is the unfortunate casualty of its success. This leads us to discuss the most important part of the story. The Divine Beasts. The Divine Beasts are a collection of machinery whose function cannot be explained in present-day Palu. This includes the Sun, also known as the Daystar. There are multiple suns that each belong to the major continents and certain worlds that exist within the sea space. To clarify, worlds are baleen creatures. The spelling is W-H-O-R-L-D-S. They are baleen creatures that carry ecosystems on their dorsal region and migrate across different continents seeking food and breeding grounds. Turning back to the Daystar, these suns are not at all like the suns we are familiar with, and are in fact artificial suns. The Kindred, which are the ancestors of the Mao and the original colonizers of the reefs, have been fabled to have been gifted these divine beasts. We know better, though, as many of the divine beasts would appear to be familiar to us from our perspective. Anything that may appear like a modern invention or something that we have yet to achieve in our own time could be deemed as a divine beast. There is also a clear difference between what is considered a divine beast and what would be considered an artifact. Artifacts are any technology or device that either used to function for society or has been decommissioned. Like, for instance, an elevator, electrical lighting, audio recordings, etc. This also includes objects discovered that once belonged to the Kindred, the ancestors of the Mao. What makes something worthy of being deemed a divine beast is something that is capable of influencing reality. So, for instance, the cloud seeding technology known as the Gyre, which is capable of changing the climate using rain, snow, or drought. Other examples include the Daystar, the Sun, which brings light to the reefs, as well as the Dyads, which are connected to the Daystar. These Dyads function to retain the energy produced from the Daystar, as well as to carry it along a sky track to the underside of the reef, where more cities and towns reside. Now, if an artifact resides within a Divine Beast, all parts of the Divine Beast are still considered as such. So, for instance, if there is an elevator in one of the dyads, each piece of the machinery is still considered a divine beast and there is no separation between them. The divine beasts are incredibly vital to the function and lives of everyone who lives in Palu. In Emmerich, their significance even extends beyond the kind of reverence other continents have for them. In Emmerich, divine beasts are viewed as guardians sent by their deity, Elelion. They have the power to enact what are known as divine wraths upon the people of Emmerich and other continents and it is believed by followers of the Cosmic Faith and members of the Fold that these wraths are a direct result of the sins of a nation. So if the divine beast known as the Ballast malfunctions and everyone is left floating briefly due to the lack of gravity, it is deeply believed that it is due to the failures of the nation, that someone or everyone has grievously angered Elelion to the point of punishing them through the Ballast. It is believed that these wraths are warnings, and that there may come a day when all of the divine beasts will forsake Palu and plunge their known world into Armageddon. The belief system of Emmerich is drenched by the influence of the Fold, that their laws are influenced by them as well. As an example, the main internal conflict of, of our lead character, Pinky, is that they are gay. In Emmerich, this is viewed as deadly, not just to the person who is gay, but to the people around this person. Members of the faith believe that homosexual desires and tendencies are a disease and can easily infect others if not quickly nipped. Indulging in same-sex intimacy is strictly prohibited. Individuals knowingly involving themselves with others experiencing such temptations may face consequences. The majority of these consequences would include the branding of a symbol of penance, public flogging, community shutting for a designated period, and corrective education. In the instance of Ziggy's moms, they face this kind of possible punishment, and worse. Because Kamea, Ziggy's adoptive mother, is Grimalkin, her relationship with Beatrice, Ziggy's biological mother, is considered interracial. During this era in Emmerich, Kamea's people are subjugated as slaves, and are viewed more like cattle rather than an individual with the same equality as your everyday male. Due to this, Kamea and Beatrice's punishment, if they were to ever be discovered, would be grisly. It would not end well for either of them, especially for Kamea. The fate of these characters, however, and whether or not they are able to navigate the political intrigue unscathed, can only be found through reading my comic. 
I hope you found this information helpful and intriguing. If you end up having additional questions about the world of starfish lovers, or otherwise, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thank you again for sticking around to the end, and if you enjoyed yourselves, consider batting that like button and subscribing. If you are eager to read my comic after this very lengthy info dump, you can find all the related links below in the description. Hope to see you next time, and have a good day or night. Thank you.